Hi, everyone. I'm Diego Rivera. I'm a principal here at Coda Capital. I wanted to welcome the audience and our panelists here to this session of Coda Access. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we really hope that you enjoyed the discussion. So before we dive into it, I'd like to share a little bit about Coda Capital. We are a technology investment firm that partners with exceptional teams to build and grow companies that are enabling the future. We have invested over a billion dollars in more than 100 modern private and public enterprise technology companies. Coda Access is an opportunity to bring together those founders and top leaders in the space to discuss topics that we believe will shape the way we live, the way we interact, and the way we do business. And today's session of Coda Access will be talking about 5G and why we think 5G is and will be the critical backbone of, the, of our economy. We'll go through a few interesting use cases about 5G. We'll talk about all the great products that our panelists are doing. And finally, we'll discuss what's next, what's right around the corner. But uh, before everything, I wanted to give uh, the audience a little bit about our panelists. So I'll let them introduce themselves. So maybe Marian, why don't you start and give everyone a little bit about your background? Hi, my name is Marian Rafugaro, and I'm one of the founders and CEO of Mobandi Corporation. Um, uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, share what Mobandi is about. So um, at Mobandi, we have been focusing on enabling um, 5G and especially uh, millimeter wave 5G, where you actually unleash the promise, the real true promise of the uh, tens of gigabits and very low latency of 5G, which enables many new applications, uh, some that already exist and enhance them, and some that we haven't even imagined. Of. Um, and this is basically the goal. Uh, we're trying to address the challenges of millimeter wave, which uh, have been talked about a lot in the news and, uh, and some of the operators have been facing, and that's basically the goal. We're trying to enable this market. Thank you very much, Maria. Sean, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Sean, founder and CEO of Inorsa. Uh, we are an automation platform for telecom deployments. And basically uh, what, the reason we exist is to enable the actual construction process of uh, the network, everything from automation for data collection in the field and validating what is accurate and then providing our customers with tools like with documents, like construction drawing, structure analysis, permitting documents and things like that. So they can go build their network and optimize and maintain it. So. Perfect, thank you. Marzia, how about you? Sure, um, thanks for having me. My name is Marzia, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Citeon Corporation. Um, my passion is wireless communication, and at Siteon, we are all focusing on providing cutting-edge, energy-efficient um, radio chipsets to essentially enable vast deployment of 5G. Um, so Siteon is really positioning itself as a disruptor in the area of RF and mixed signal chipsets, and we're doing that by focusing on versatility of radios, which essentially leads to fast deployment of 5G infrastructure, and we're also focusing on energy efficiency, which again means, um, you know, feasibility of deployment and ultimately energy conservation, which is something that we all care about so much. So we are all about um, enabling the ecosystem to adapt to 5G. Perfect, thank you. And then last but not least, I also want to introduce you to Hussein Moin. And, and Hussein, before you, you talk a little bit about yourself, I just want to tell the audience, uh, Hussein is an operating partner here at Coda Capital. And prior to joining Coda, he was the global CTO of Nokia. And he was also an instrumental piece in the development of the actual specification of LTE and 5G technologies. <laughs> So it's really excited to, to have him here uh, joining the, the panel. So saying, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you very much, uh, Diego, for that kind introduction. I think uh, I can add very little to what you just said, other than it is, uh, for me, mobile communication is a means to an end. It actually enables applications. It actually enables changes in human behavior. And these are the kind of things that I believe technology was set out to do. 
It's a pleasure to be in this panel with such distinguished members. And I hope that we can bring 5G to life in during this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we dive into the discussion, I, I wanted to give the audience a little bit about 5G and why we think this is such a critical space and a critical development for, for our economy. So whatever new technology, whether it's coming from the second generation to the third generation or the fourth generation 5G now coming around the 2020 year, uh, there's always been waves of infrastructure development. As an example here, you can see on the slide, wireless carriers in the US spend north of $30 billion every year with deploying this new technology. And this only goes up from 3G when average was around $20 billion to 4G, 25, 28. Now it's north of $33 billion every year and it only goes up. This is one critical component of what everyone just talked about here of deploying that infrastructure that's going to allow for, for an infinite amount of applications to build on top of it. And then what it's really excited about 5G in our opinion, it's not only it's better, it's, <clears throat> it's extremely faster, it has lower latency and it can give way more throughput for the same channel, same connectivity. And in our mind, it will enable a vast amount of applications that we can't even begin to think about it right now. Uh, what comes to mind is a massive adoption of IoT, for instance, or Industry 4.0, where everything is connected at the factory floor, or autonomous vehicle and all the connectivity that it needs and all the data that's being collected while a vehicle drives. So this is just the beginning and the spearhead of what we think it's going to be a massive uh, to a uh, spur of innovation and applications in the real world. And last but not least, the way that we think about it is the network is going to be a hybrid uh, solution. There's, there's uh, places where we're definitely going to need uh, the, the millimeter wave, high throughput, high density area for that type of application. But in, as you go out in that boundaries of less density and, and more rural areas, there are other technologies that are going to come alongside, whether it's C-band, sub-6, or even for GLT right now. So we think that this is how the network is going to shape up in the future. And one key aspect of 5G that gets really excited that was the development in the very nascent, uh, uh, the very beginning of it was the 5G network slicing. And basically, it allows you for, at the network level, gives different levels of service for different applications. And this is critical because you can literally at the network side say this IoT device needs X amount of bandwidth and X amount of latency. And you have some more criticality, whether it's a medicine at the edge or all other critical applications for robotics, you can give way better latency and better throughput as well. So this is it. This is what why we think it's 5G is super interesting and exciting for the economy. And that's why we have such uh, amazing panelists here to talk about it. So I'll stop sharing and I'll, I want to talk uh, to the panelists and hear what they have to say. So Sean, why, why don't we start with you? Um, about 5G, what's exciting uh, for you? How do you see maybe 5G in five or, or 10 years time shaping up the way that we live or the way that we do business? Yeah, I think we are on a kind of a different angle than just the technology side on the 5G. When you learn how to enable building a massive amount of infrastructure, like how with 5G small cells are upgrading the existing towers and building a lot of fiber and all of that. It's not just the technology we're enabling, it's the construction technology side of it too. And we see that a lot with our customers that are now going from building a big network of small cells to IoT devices or EV charging stations or solar, because you have a lot of similarity between them. So I think, a very interesting side benefit of 5G deployment for us and for our customers, not only is maintaining and optimizing the network, especially like on the power side, which I think Marzia can speak a lot about, but also it's just enabling to build a lot of high volume of infrastructure. Uh, yeah, I think it feels like the, based on everything that we just saw, the amount of investments being made, there is going to be a major shift in, in the way people do, uh, deploy in the way that they need to be more nimble around it. Yeah, exactly. 
And then, um, so maybe Marianne, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, how you envision 5G shaping up in the next five to 10 years? What's excited about it for, from your perspective? What really is exciting about 5G to me is that it really, really has the potential to be the revolution that everyone talks about. Uh, you know, so far, every G has been more incremental. Um, and I think 5G has the potential. People talk a lot about it. It really could create a huge opportunity for many new applications that uh, I really think we have not thought about. Like, you know, when, uh, just to give you a very quick example, when we did Bluetooth initially, like 20 years ago for the first time, I don't think we, even we had imagined that this would go to all billions of devices in applications that I could not imagine today. It was all about headset. Same thing here. If you look at 5G today, people are just talking about, okay, higher speed and lower, they talk about lower latency, but I really haven't seen that happening yet in applications that truly can revolutionize our industry, including telemedicine, aut um, autonomous cars, et cetera, which people keep talking about. But at the end of the day, you should have, and you really need the technology and basically the innovations to bring that together. And I think 5G is basically uh, what brings this all together. And again, it should, it's not, it has to be all bands. It has to be where you can actually bring all this together. And that's one of the reasons we have been really trying to address the challenges in the high band where some of these new applications can really all come together. Um, and I can see this to be the beginning of 6G where sensing come into the picture. So, it's, so I really think this can change the whole industry and enable a lot of, uh, a lot of new stuff that has not been there. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's uh, we're just at the beginnings of it. And, and as I mentioned on, on my slides, I think the, the, the need to be that complementary of all those technologies, it's, uh, it's great. And then, and then maybe Marcia, why don't you uh, tell us uh, your vision? How do you see that shaping up? Sure, of course. Um, I, I also think that, that 5G will drastically change our lifestyles. It will have a huge impact on it because it's been designed to be a revolution from its core. You can think about applications from both sides, from the consumer sides and from the providers of services and goods. Um, and I mean, we have talked about, um, you know, throwing sensors in forests and detecting, um, you know, fire immediately and instantly. We, are, we have talked about, you know, remote surgery and, and, and also from the manufacturing side of it, you know, creating a digital twin of the factory and monitoring the operation. These are all, you know, amazingly good um, applications that, you know, these concepts, are, they're, as, as, they're not generated, you know, yesterday. There are, there are ideas that have been in, in, in the research community and in the manufacturing community for been explored and discussed. And the base 5G was actually designed and it, it, it's designed to treat these applications the way they deserve. So that's why when you talk about them, it, they, they weren't possible before. You can think about just 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 improving speed is not going to get you there. You really need to design that core, as you also mentioned, to to do network slicing, to treat these packets differently if they're coming from IoT network or massive machine type, or if they're just a mobile or a, or a sensor, the network shouldn't treat them the same way. And that's why um, the the way five G was designed from from the bottom up. It's it's to do that. So I really think that this will happen once the infrastructure is built what the network is deployed, that's when we can really get to, um, and on top of all of that, get, get to take advantage of AI because AI is really all about instantly collecting data in a massive scale, doing edge compute, and ultimately providing some uh, a real brain or intelligence to spaces and to collection of objects. So 5G will enable that. And I'm, I'm actually personally very excited to see that future. And I don't think it's very, far from now because infrastructure is getting there, technology is getting there. So we can see that in the next five to 10 years for sure. Yeah, no, this is great. This is great. And I think maybe um, to kind of like tie it all together, I was saying based on uh, what you've seen from the early days of, of, of actually thinking about it, thinking about 4G and 5G, um, why, don't, why don't you tell us um, how, how they evolve over time from that early designing stage as to what you're seeing right now and how you envision this uh, in the future. And Jose, I think you might be on mute. There you well, go. First, let me take myself off of mute. Uh, I think 
One of the things I remember vividly from uh, 5G that Marzi also pointed out was that when we designed LTE, and I was really involved in that in its design in the early days, uh, we had a very clear idea of what we are designing for, meaning that uh, we were targeting a better mobile broadband. That was our target. And I think we delivered on that. Now, we obviously did not foresee anything regarding uh, applications. So uh, for example, think of Uber. Uber would, would have been impossible on a 3G network, but now it's an instrumental part of daily life in many markets, in many cities, in many places. And I think 5G will have maybe a more meaningful impact because in addition to connecting people, which is what we did with LTE and 3G and 2G, it connects things. In fact, it connects everything and everyone. So the vision is that by creating all these connections, something good will happen. And I think that we took in the early design from biology that actually having many more interconnection between your neurons will make you a more intelligent person. So the point was to make the network more intelligent. And again, we decided that we'll do three things. One is we will improve the capacity of the network. Right? This is something that actually uh, Mariam and her company are pioneering in many ways. The second area was that we will actually have everything connected. And that really gives you a much more dense network. So today, if, if there are maybe a thousand people around the cell, you'd not be able to place a call. So that we like to overcome issues like that, where we can have millions of connections per square kilometer. And last but not least, and this is the one that's closest to my heart, is that we decided to create the network to become ultra re reliable and very low latency. In fact, it's not low latency, it's deterministic latency. So what I wanted to do and what uh, industry wanted to do was to create a network that can be used as a real-time system. So now we have all these enablers and now we depend on the ecosystem to come up with the applications and use cases that will truly take advantage of these new capabilities and that will truly transform life, work, play, and society. No, thanks, Hussein. I really like the, the Uber analogy. I think if I were to add to it, it's almost like let's build and they will come, the innovators will come and the, the new technology will build, develop and on top of this. So it's super interesting. And then maybe uh, uh, taking one step forward on this, uh, maybe I'll start with Marzia. Marzia, why don't you tell us a little bit about SciTune and how are you uh, basically enabling that vision that we just talked about? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we, we discussed um, um, here that you know 5G is very diverse when it comes to its applications. And that's actually the goal. The goal is to be able to provide services um, and, and those services are very specific to even to some cases into, into areas and use cases and, and um, you know, the type of market. And so what that translates into is really um, a variety of um, wireless channel specification. You know, we want to increase capacity and throughput, and you also want to increase coverage. Um, so that means, you know, different bandwidths, different signal powers, different frequency ranges. So what we're doing at SiteTune is that we are working very closely, not only we're offering cost-effective, energy-efficient, you know, RF chipsets, radio chipsets, but what we're doing is that we're working very closely with you know, design houses and, and equipment manufacturers to build the end-to-end -end system, optimize the performance. And, and, and that's where you know, we really enable that by, by um, providing um, you know, technology in a way that makes the whole, um, the whole system actually feasible. And as, as, as we said, that, that goes to energy and that goes to um, cost. Both are very equally important factor of that thing. And we are able to do that because our products are very versatile, multi-standard, they cover a wide range. We kind of looked at 
what 5G wants to do and took it from there when we defined these products. They didn't say, hey, let's see what can be done. And rather we went through the core of the technology and what is needed from the market for a long time. And that's how we came up with these products. On top of that, you know, I can tell you, maybe we're working with 90% of OEMs and ODMs worldwide who are really designing small cell solutions. Um, it's, it's been a very interesting. Um, I, have, I have some stories to tell, but anyway, um, the, the, the things are happening, so I'm excited. <laughs> no, this is great. And I, and I think one thing that you, that you touched on that I thought I've, I've been hearing also from the market is like the energy efficiency is something super critical, right? For actually the point is now where people are seeing on the field how important it is to convert the actual size that they have right now uh, from 4G to 5G. And maybe uh, uh, maybe we can ask Sean based on his experience on the field and having like been on the front line of this. Sean, what, what are you seeing? What are, uh, and then also please tell us a little bit more about Northside. Yeah, so power is a big problem. And the way we, um, we just don't try to solve the power problem, but we try to solve the construction basically deployment issues. And the way we do it is in different layers. I think the first layer is telecom or any sort of infrastructure is a huge data problem. There are all these like documents and information on every site and every asset and every location uh, and nothing matches anything. So data validation is a big piece of our business, but also how we enable customers to basically figure out what they can actually build without going to the sites or going to a lot of basically manual process, yeah. which is impossible for a human not to make mistakes. So that's the first layer of it. And then we build layer after layer on top of each other. I think some of it is just basic automation. Some of it goes to AI and machine learning applications. So starting from, for example, using that data to automate construction drawings, lease agreements, permitting documents. So a customer that had to wait like two weeks to a month to get their, these permitting documents together. Now they can get it done in like literally a few minutes and then past that point is how do you optimize after you have all these data you help the customer to generate these documents and stuff like that so you can go get their permits go get, build their sites now it's like problems like power problems or even location specific problems that how do you optimize construction how do you make sure if you build a small saw on the side of the road the car is not going to like have challenges hitting that light pole or if you're on a tower how do you make that construction easier and how do you optimize the power in terms of how much they have to dig what's the power on where is the next source of power available which i think that is one of the biggest issues right now yeah. uh, considering how much power consumption is going up uh, so for us it's a layer to layer approach and once it all comes together it comes down to now we are automating this process site by site but now we are able to automate basically a massive amount of deployment at the same time. So now it's not like I'm building one side at a time on decreasing your, I know, a month turnaround time to like two days. Now it's also that I'm decreasing that volume. So now you can basically an analyze 100,000 sites, 10,000 sites, whatever is that volume at the same time and just enable that kind of deployment to be done in magnitude faster than what it was before. So, yeah. No, no, that's that's right. super clear. That's that's super exciting as well, and and definitely based on all all I've heard from you and in the past is so so much needed in the marketplace. People do so much by hand that uh, that makes I'm excited to see what where it's going. And then maybe uh, uh, quickly, Marion, why don't you tell us um, first of all a little bit more about Movendi and and what you guys offer your product, but how do you think that's going to enable the vision that we were talking about? How do you think that's going to help us bridge all the challenges that, that we see right now into this new world that, that Hussein was talking about, ultra-reliable, high-speed, low-latency that we've been uh, all excited? It's a, you know, I really believe in people being able to be rich, to have access to no matter how many people are in one location, you know, to that, so that you know, if there is one thing that this uh, COVID taught us is that you can't be limited to just one location and you can't rely on the infrastructure that exists today to be able to function. And, you know, these things happen. This won't be the last time. So uh, I think it was, you know, even though COVID may have had bad impact in general, but it had, it brought awareness to everyone that, 
uh, you should be able to operate, you should be able to do your work and be able to be reached uh, at any point of time. Uh, and that's, that's really, I think that was the good thing coming out. So I believe, and I think Movandi in general believes in uh, flexibility, reliability. Uh, so we call it wireless fiber. There is no reason that you have to go through everything, constructions, the cost of it, everything to bring data speed and low latency and accessibility to people. Uh, we would, would, our goal and mission is to enable this market so that no matter whether you're in a studio where there are thousands of people at the same time or where you're at an isolated place somewhere in you know, Africa, uh, you, you, you are able to get access and you are, if school goes out, you're still, you can have video streaming, you can actually have classes and, uh, you know, in the middle of the, your education, your video stream doesn't drop, which we all, ex, you know, kind of uh, experience. So what we're doing is trying to enable this uh, gigabits data support, uh, high capacity, which has no limitations on the number of people or devices, as you know, Hussein mentioned that 5G actually supports all devices. It's not just people anymore. IoT, a huge number of data cameras. So for that reason, we have been focusing on millimeter. We're providing the core technology that's needed to enable that market. And we have been beyond the core technology, which is our chipsets and algorithm and software and module, et cetera, and the whole beam forming front end. We have been working very closely with the operators to try to address the main challenge of millimeter wave, which is the coverage. That's the only challenge, you know, penetration, blockage. And coming up with a system that we have been basically providing the core technology and our partners are putting the uh, product together, the box together, uh, which is called the smart repeaters. And that basically enables, uh, for example, the enterprises offices to bring the signal inside uh, despite you know, walls, it's everything and be able to extend that uh, inside the building. So uh, this is what we're trying to do. And I think, uh, you know, Sean and the team have been doing grand other companies have been doing coming up with innovative solutions of how to implement these things and and deploy these things so that the cost and capex come down and uh, and I think you know there is a lot that can be done in this area. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm I'm thanks for thanks for the introduction and I'm I'm really excited to see the three of you guys and at, at scale deployed in the real world and how much you're going to enable and I think. Uh, Hussein, if, if we were to fast forward, uh, imagining that we have Movandi, SciTune, and Norsa all over the place and enabling this e infrastructure and this ecosystem, um, what kind of applications are you excited about? If you have like any one specific example that, that you wish you were here, it was here already, or that gets you uh, really uh, you know, motivated to help and facilitate this ecosystem to flourish. Once again, I was on mute, but now that I'm not mute, uh, let's take a step back. In 2G uh, time frame, we actually had voice and text. When 3G came along, we were able to access internet from anywhere where we had a connection, which was almost everywhere. In 4G, we were able to stream videos very effectively and watch them on our small screens. Some may argue it's not really an advancement, but it is an advancement from a network perspective. In 5G, I see three classes of applications. I see applications that are immersive. So building on streaming, we will have a combination of physical and digital and virtual coming all together in what is now commonly called metaverse. So that's one class of application. And a couple of good examples of that are actually non-entertainment related. One is the flexibility of an assembly line where we can quickly reorder how we build things as we get more and more automated in our factories. So factory automation and manufacturing automation 
would be something that will bring that immersive part uh, into reality. The second class of applications would be intelligence. So think of intelligent robots that interact not only with uh, their human uh, counterparts, but also with each other. Some are specialized in one area, others in other areas. But when they together they combine, they can actually deliver real value. Now, if you live, happen to live in uh, Palo Alto, you probably have seen some of these automated robots already. Now, the third would be adapt. The third class of application will have adapt adaptive nature, which allows it to adapt to an ever-changing environment. So that also is very exciting. This will make our cities intelligent, our transportation autonomous and intelligent, and will bring a lot of uh, value to the humanity as a whole. Now, I think all of that said, we also have to be very cognizant that the world is changing and not always for the better. Climate change is a real concern. And I think telecom has taken uh, an approach that is probably going to help. Uh, I also think that uh, even without 5G, we can safely say that telecom communication is a critical infrastructure for society. The pandemic clearly proved that. And I think it will become more and more critical, just like electricity has been part of our lives. We will only notice telecommunication when it's absent. So you don't really pay attention when you go to somewhere that has electricity. Your attention is only caught when it's not there. I think mobile networks have certainly become that, but I think more and more applications of mobile network will become just like that. So it's a very interesting times. It is a lot of opportunities for people to build on what these three wonderful entrepreneurs have done. And it is time to invest both in terms of capital, but also in terms of human intelligence as to what can be solved. Now you said one application. For me, it was telemedicine. I picture behind me is drawn by someone who was an amputee. If she had seen the doctor sooner and a specialist, she would have not lost her arm. So to me, this is personal, and I hope that we can deliver on the promise of right. Um, thank you, Hussein. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the story. It's, uh, it's definitely um, impactful, and, and this is something that we all look for and look forward to have that infrastructure in place so, so lives can be saved and we can have that, that better connectivity and the better uh, service provided to, to the overall population. So maybe I want to turn to the, the other panelists. Is there any interesting applications that you are seeing uh, in, your, in your space in the area right now that, that you want to share or any uh, companies that are like, maybe without saying names, I guess, uh, that you can share about uh, that will get like everyone excited about what's coming? I can talk Just, about energy. Go ahead, Maya. Uh, no, go ahead. I just wanted to add to the to the to the you know power consumption and um, you know really what's what excites me is the fact that we see this movement towards solving this problem. So this is correct. Power has been one of the major issues in in sort of slowing down the deployment of 5G infrastructure. I think Sean can add to that. You know, you really go to, and you want to build a big tower. Um, the amount of electricity that you need to supply to that tower and uh, MNOs, service providers, mobile network, you know, manufacturers, they have real issues with that. And if you think about it in its core, you know, um, generally the chipset industry did not pay attention to power before because 4G and LTE, as we've been discussing, were completely different. And when we're moving to this area where um, you can't just talk about power, you really have to attack it in its core. And then there are two ways that the industry is going at this problem. 
Um, so one, one thing that we see that's very exciting for me is the fact that really the chipset industry is focusing on lowering that power consumption from both the system level and the chipset level. Um, um, you know, all the innovation is going toward that. We are also part of it. You know, our solutions are um, literally 80 consuming 80% less power comparing to the current solutions in the industry. And, and, and that, that's been our focus for years. So I'm, I'm very happy that we can utilize and leverage that in the 5G uh, space. The other thing that's, that the industry is going after that's also interesting to me is that, you know, um, uh, the, the, the towers are big, they consume a lot of um, energy. Um, we're seeing that in parts of the world, um, and parts, you know, in, in this, is, this might not be happening everywhere, but in parts of the world, the focus has been moved to installing low cost, low power small cells in large numbers to try to increase coverage. Coverage is a big deal, as if you cannot reach to people, um, really, you cannot build that 5G infrastructure. So now we're hearing that, you know, MNOs are, 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 are going toward building, you know, massive numbers of small cells with small costs and, um, and, and low power. That is, is, is good news, which means, you know, next year, within the next, you know, year, at least by next year to this time, we will have this, you know, jump in terms of coverage. And once coverage happens, you can build that core um, sort of in the meantime, so by that time, infrastructure is there, you can really take advantage of what 5G has to offer. Yeah, that, no, that makes total sense. And I think, uh, uh, Marion, you were going to say something, but uh, to build on, on what Marzia was saying, I think you guys also see that as a critical uh, uh, vision for this, for this deployment. It's like literally spreading and making more affordable and efficient to deploy 5G through through both of you, Saturn and Movandi's uh, technology, right? Right. I mean, that's generally the trend, right? I mean, again, when you start a new technology in the beginning, the prices are high and the powers are high, but very quickly, you know, uh, things change and it has to change. So you see it with 2G, you see it with 3G, 4G. So the devices are going to become much cheaper. They're going to become higher performance, et cetera. And that's, that's, that happens with any new technology and that will be the trend. That's what we're focusing on. That's what Marzi is focusing on. And you know, everyone in the industry and, and it's the good thing because as soon as you, that, as soon as that happens and the availability becomes uh, easier then things are gonna all of a sudden become drastically faster. Uh, so there are a few challenges here, right? It's the device not being available or not optimized yet. For example, there are cell phones with, uh, I would say today with 5G and 5G millimeter wave went, and the power is not good enough yet. Again, I'm saying yet, because I know a year from now, everything's gonna be different. <laughs> So, and as soon as it's like a chicken and egg, right? So the devices become available, infrastructure is gonna build more and, and it automatically it becomes like a positive, uh, you know, feedback loop. <laughs> so, so the good thing about 5G, I would say, uh, you know, we've been talking about XR, AR, VR, companies been spending a lot of money on these applications, right? And at the end of the day, the, some of the limitations for that to pick up is uh, the support for how fast, the speed, the latency, et cetera, that can support, right? Um, and I think 5G can dramatically change that. And I think at the end of the day, especially when millimeter wave becomes more available, it's gonna be the real experience of XR. And I can see that now picking up momentum. So I think XR will be definitely a big application. Uh, you know, again, I think, Fix wireless, that, that's one of the near applications It's happening and it's gonna bring some of these other applications into the picture. So once enterprise can actually bring the highest speed and low latency into the building, then all these other applications around it are gonna be built in. Uh, there are so many applications, all these cameras, you know, the terabytes of, terabytes of data inside the cars, inside buildings. So, so uh, it, it will be very exciting and I can see that, you know, very soon many of these applications are going to be built around that, um, again, as soon as devices are more available. And more that, that, I'm, I'm hoping that in six months time, we all come back again together and talk about what we're seeing. So this is, this is super interesting. And then Sean, uh, again, like having that that pulse in the in the field in the market, what are like interesting applications that you are 
already hearing about and people like talking when they come to you and, and talk about their deployment uh, in the field? Yeah, one of the in like one of basically our main jobs uh, is to figure out where the market is going, so we can enable our customers with the tools they need to go basically build their network. So, to everybody's point, I think, uh, for example, when Hossein was saying factories and uh, a lot of like really private networks that are trying to have their own uh, infrastructure. That's where we see a lot of growth in terms of providing tools for our customers, where it's like a big enterprise, like a factory campus or like an apartment complex. I think that's going to be another one huge area of uh, for 5G. And then when it comes to uh, the power side of things, that's what we see a lot of energy as service companies, like a lot of companies like Cytoon and Movandi, which provide lower power solution, but I think it's very, very useful, especially when it comes to small cells. But also on the tower side, uh, we see a lot of energy as service companies that are customers on the solar side of things that are coming up to basically solve the energy solution from another angle. And the third thing is what other side applications can we provide that are very similar to 5G deployment uh, for our customers basically to be able to not only gain more business, but also build something that's useful for general population like uh like we mentioned small cells are very similar to ev charging stations solar is another similar angle it's a lot of iot applications that are coming up that we want to get ahead of because when there is a need and the market is growing uh, it's all late to build that tool or that technology capability for the customers to go basically they have to go do it manually the same old ways and i think one exciting thing is the more uh, it's like 5G kind of it all, especially the high bandwidth and stuff like is providing our capability to build more of the same network, right? Uh, so yeah, I think those are the three main areas, especially the last one where what else is coming up that is either built on the 5G network or very similar applications that have to be built out there. And also they have a lot less baggage. So there's a lot less data problem up front and giving everybody a head start there. Uh, we've been very successful with solar and charging stations. Uh, I think utilities, data centers, there are a lot of our applications that are very similar to. And, and you know, I, I'd like to actually emphasize what Sean is trying to do. It's really, really a big part of this whole 5G because deployment and business model has become a big thing in this, uh, especially as the frequency goes higher and then you need more of these, uh, you know, these base stations or small cells to be put around. So, this uh, this 5G has created new initiatives. Even you know, I hear roofing companies, uh, window companies, glasses. I mean, everyone now is trying to figure out how they can actually uh, get into business and and you know, create new innovative business models and solutions. Uh, so it's it's really actually it's. I really see that as exciting that, you know, everyone now, no matter what business you are in, whether it's on the deployment side or on the business model side or, or actually device side, everyone is, has, it, it has ignited something in the industry and it's exciting. I think what Sean is trying to do is really absolutely important in this area. Yeah, and one of the exciting projects actually worked on Movandi with was basically figuring out how much by magnitude more efficient it is to build repeaters uh, on a large scale rather than like a lot of other stuff. So uh, I think that's one area that like Movandi and a lot of other companies like Cytron are getting ahead is just work solving the problem from end to beginning and seeing how much actually you're going to save by or how much faster it's going to be able to build an alternative type of network rather than just what we've been doing so far. It is uh, super exciting. It, it, it does feel to me like the, a true ecosystem emerging around this uh, network deployment and, and actually being enabled by what 5G uh, really promises. So I know we're coming out of time. So I, I want to really thank you all, this uh, amazing panelists for your time and, and for sharing a little bit of your knowledge with us. I have uh, one, list, one, one last thing that I wanted to share with you guys uh, from our legal department. There's a, here's a legal disclaimer. So if you don't mind taking a moment uh, to read through it, but uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for joining the session and thank you the panelists for, for taking the time to speak with us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you everyone, you. it was a great conversation. Thank you.